Hi, BioFam. It's Mr. Hajarian, and this is our first lecture of evolution. All right, so evolution can be kind of a tough topic, tough um, in our curriculum, but I know you got this. All right, let's start. This is called Intro to Evolution PowerPoint or Natural Se uh, Selection PowerPoint or Darwin's Theory of Natural Selection. So let's get started. Okay, so Darwin was not the first person to believe that populations can actually change over time, uh, even though we know Darwin as the father of evolution. There's a little joke for you down there. I'm sure you get it. So Lamarck was actually the first guy that uh, came up with the theory of evolution. And his theory was that all organisms have this tendency to always move towards perfection or to evolve towards perfection. So, for example, he said, as birds keep trying to fly, they develop larger wings uh, as they develop their, their flight skills. And that organisms could actually change the shape of an organ by using it in a new way, or they could lose the use of that organ by not using it anymore, which is what we call use and disuse. So, again, going back to the bird example, Lamarck would say that if uh, birds stop using their wings, they would eventually lose those wings. So we know that Lamarck's theories of evolution are wrong. But we still want to give him some credit for being the first to come up with his theories of evolution. He also talked about acquired traits. So Lamarck also said, uh, that if you build muscles lifting weights, your offspring, your children, will have big muscles too because of the big muscles that you have now built, which would be awesome if that was true, but we know that that is not true. So good try, Lamarck, but not correct. So we're going to be talking about a giraffe example uh, to help you understand what Lamarck believed and what Darwin believed and which one's true. So going into it, let's remember Lamarck's theory of evolution was actually wrong. So let's start with giraffes. So what's, think about what's the reason why giraffes have really long necks. Here's what Lamarck would have said. Back when there were plenty of leaves to eat, giraffes had short necks. See, all these guys have short necks. Okay? In time, giraffes uh, stripped the lower branches bare so that the only available ones were higher up. Notice how they're all looking up because they've eaten all this food down here. So what do we do? We need food. So they started to stretch their necks to reach those higher leaves. So notice how they're stretching their necks up here to reach those leaves. And these giraffes that stretched their necks, uh, their necks were stretched permanently, and they passed this trait onto their offspring, resulting in long-necked giraffes. So you might think, wow, that's such a silly idea. Why, do, why would he believe that? But remarkably, a lot of people believed what he was saying. So... So that's Lamarck's theory of evolution. Now here's Charles Darwin and his theory, which, which is what we call natural selection. Okay, so natural selection is about this. Nature selects organisms for survival. So the organisms that are best adapted to the environment survive and reproduce. You guys know what these guys are? Maybe, maybe not. They have kind of a funny name. So anyway, going back to natural selection, again, remember, nature selects the organisms uh, that are best adapted to that environment, whatever that environment might be. Here are four components of natural selection that are really important for us to know. All right? So first, in nature, organisms produce many offspring, and there aren't always enough resources. Second, in any population, variations exist. This is a really, really big deal. Think about where variation comes from. Remember crossing over? That's what we're talking about. Individuals with favorable variations survive and reproduce. And this is what we call the struggle for existence. Okay? Favorable variations. What determines whether a variation is favorable or not? Do you know? It is the environment. And last but not least, favorable variations are inherited by offspring. So if you have a long neck as a giraffe, you're going to pass on that long neck to your offspring. All right, so the four components of natural selection. I know this movie is, is super old, but this is one of my favorite movies, um, Nacho Libre, Survival of the Fittest. So what we just talked about is the idea of survival of the fittest. Now, we have to make sure we remember something because I think a lot of us think about survival of the fittest as who's the fittest, like who's the, the buffest or the fastest, or and that could be the case. But 
Survival of the fittest really means the ability to pass on your genes onto the next generation. And it may not have anything to do with how big and buff you are. So which one of these guys is more fit? Arnold or, or Bill Gates? What do you think? Right off the bat, you might think, well, Arnold, because he's a bigger guy and he's got all these muscles. Uh, but not necessarily true. you got to think about who has uh, an ability to pass on their genes to their, to their children and how many children they each have. So don't be fooled by that question just looking at the person who, who looks bigger or buffer. All right, here's Darwin's evolution of natural selection. So the same idea with the giraffe. So back when there were plenty of leaves to eat, most giraffes had short necks. Okay, But some did have longer necks. Variation, that's where variation comes in. In time, giraffes stripped the lower branches bare so that the only leaves were higher up. Just like before, all the food's now up here. All these guys are starving. And this tall one over here, this one's happy because it can get all the food. So what happens? The short neck ones, they start to die off because they can't, they can't eat. And perhaps there's no altruism. So these tall ones are kind of like everyone for themselves. And they're eating the leaves and the shorter ones die off. And the taller ones survive, they reproduce, and they give um, their offspring end up having tall necks too, or long necks too. Eventually, only long neck giraffes are left. So this is Darwin's theory of evolution, which is correct. So this is the one we're going to stick with. Now here's a common misconception. It's important to remember that natural selection comes from existing variations. This is really important. I think sometimes we think, oh, what if this thing pops up or like giraffes will have green skin or whatever, all kinds of crazy stuff. And yeah, that stuff, I guess in a way, you know, if you think about what mutations do, it is possible, but we're just talking about existing variations. So whatever they have in their population already as far as their, uh, their genes and traits. What else did I want to tell you? Um, where does genetic variation come from? We talked about this one already. Remember it? Crossing over. There is our wonderful school bell. All right. Remember mutations too. So these are two things you're going to remember when you're asked the question, where do variations come from? Crossing over and mutations. Remember the different types of mutations? You don't have to, I'm just saying. So, fit for the environment. What are mutations? Think about that. Remember that they are random. And this is something we talked about in our last unit. Are mutations good or are they bad? And hopefully you remember the answer is that it depends completely on the environment. Okay, so here's an example. I'm going to skip this example and we can chat about it in class. So here's an example that I'll talk about. Ice fish. Ice fish are found in deep cold waters. And they have a loss of a globin gene, which means that it's entirely or partially deleted. And this helps them gain this antifreeze protein, which means that they actually can't freeze in super cold and frozen waters, which I think is really cool. And here are some results of natural selection. So we got something like mimicry. What is mimicry? when you mimic something, when you mimic something that could potentially be dangerous. So uh, this moth, what is it mimicking? It's called an owl moth because it's mimicking an owl. Um, the venomous coral snake versus the harmless milk snake. Why would the harmless milk snake want to look like the venomous coral snake? Because it gains an advantage. That's why. Camouflage, I think this is super cool too. So this is the idea that you start to blend in with your environment so that predators wouldn't be able to see you. So I don't know if you can see this guy over here. This one's pretty cool right here. You can see him at the Monterey Aquarium. And then see if you can see something here. What's going on? See this fish over here? Pretty cool. What is that, mimicry or camouflage? Okay, just a few more examples. We'll skip through these. Okay, let's get into divergent evolution. So. Uh, diversity through divergent evolution. The term diverge it means to sort of go separate directions. So it's when closely related species evolve in different directions and they become different as they continue to evolve. So here are some examples. That's supposed to be everything that is 
house cat, lion, tiger. Okay? Now here's what convergent evolution means. It means evolution towards similar characteristics. Now, there's a misconception here. It's not that organisms are evolving together to become one. That is not what's happening. Because of their environments, they are evolving in a, uh, in a direction where they ha their characteristics starts to resemble each other. Okay? So think about what's going on with all these examples we have. So we've got a fish. We got this penguin who it, it looks like it's a flying penguin, but it's not. <laughs> and then we have dolphins. So do they all have something in common? Yes. They don't all have the same origin, but uh, they all have the ability to swim. All right, vestigial structures. This is a term we're going to talk about a lot in uh, this unit. So a vestigial structure is a structure you have in your body that has little or no function. Uh, and it gives you clues about our evolutionary history. So, for example, in humans, you know, body hair is one of them. Appendix, um, this one sort of goes back and forth, but there's actually a little tiny reason why we need it. Um, I don't know that it's still considered a vestigial structure. Our wisdom teeth would be considered vestigial structures. Our tailbone is considered a vestigial structure. Uh, and then in other species, the pelvis of a whale um, and, and so on. Okay. Then we got analogous structures, analogous, like an analogy. So there are structures that perform a similar function. So in this case, we have a fly and a bat, and they both have the ability to fly, but they're not similar in their origin. And finally, homologous structures. And homologous structures, as opposed to analogous structures, are structures that are going to be similar in structure. Uh, but they appear different and uh, they have different functions. So, for example, when we take, uh, think about the um, human arm, oop, let me go back. We think about the human arm, uh, think about the bone structure in there. And then the bones of a bat wing, same as a bird wing. So, they all have, um, you know, when you think about their origin, they're all coming sort of from an origin from the same place, but they all have different functions. All right, so that's the end of that, uh, biofans. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture, um, and I will see you in class.